Hello, this is Jeff of Tau Flare Mouse. We've got another interesting experimental slug to show you, this time from a viewer named Brian Gridell. Gridell? Gridell? Now this is a steel slug made from a nitrous canister, but filled with some interesting materials. Now Brian sent a box just chock full of different slugs, and a lot of these just vary in weight and design, and some weigh 27 grams, some weigh 57 grams. As you see, we have a lot of variations here. Some are a round nose, some are a flat nose, some are a hollow point, some are a hollow base, some are a solid base. But they are beautifully made, but it's still a loader's nightmare to try to work with all those different variables. But fortunately, Brian sent eight that are exactly the same. They are a hollow base or butt, uh, steel jacketed with a lead weight of some sort inside. And this is what it looks like. And again, the workmanship is just really nice on these slugs. Now this is where the center of gravity is. They're pretty nose heavy, and these might work pretty well through a smooth bore without any spin at all. That'll be interesting. Now these are one inch in length or 25 millimeters, but the issue here is the diameter. It's 0.710, and I prefer a diameter of 0.675. Since the bore diameter is 0.730, this only gives us 10 thousandths of an inch or a quarter of a millimeter between this slug and the barrel. Now that's cutting it very close and I want to avoid any kind of steel on steel contact and possibly damaging a barrel. Now normally when people submit slugs to us to test, they make them 0.675 inches. This way we can use a Sabo that is 30 thousandths of an inch thick, or about the gap of a spark plug. This is the ideal diameter, and it allows the designer to come up with really wild designs using almost any kind of material, and we don't have to worry about the barrel damage. Now, Brian and I emailed back and forth trying to resolve this issue, and he suggested that we try this Teflon material. It's about 15 thousandths of an inch thick, and we'll make a Sabo out of that. It's still a pretty tight fit, but at least we have Teflon between the steel slug and the barrel now. Now with any type of hollow base slug, you have very little bearing surface. And with 10 to 12,000 PSI of chamber pressure, the wad can get shoved into that cavity quite easily. And the solution I found that works really well is the wet toilet paper plug. We take the wet toilet paper slurry and just pack it in there. And then in a day or so, it dries out and is very light and almost doesn't compress at all. It's very strong material and it's just simple and cheap, like me. We'll use the FS12 gas seal and on top of that a couple of nitro cards just to further protect that gas seal from damage. And for our powder charge we'll use 30 grains of steel. Hey that looks like a crack pipe. Ha <laughs> ha! Now steel is the name of the powder and honestly it's not my favorite powder. It's really limited to payloads one and a half, two ounces, real heavy turkey loads. And if you try to use it for lighter loads, it often won't even ignite. But it's a slow burning powder that is designed to prevent barrel damage from using steel shot. Now before I roll crimp it, I'll slip those Teflon Sabos in. There's three of them with a little gap in between. That'll give us a little growing room space. But as you can see, there was a whole lot of thought and planning behind the loading of these things to make them safe to make them functional and hopefully stable as they fly through the air. And finally, the thing I haven't addressed yet is the shape. These things are shaped much like a naval torpedo. Now I think you'll find it interesting how the shape doesn't really affect it aerodynamically so much, but hydrodynamically as it passes through fluids and gels and stuff like that. Anyway, let's get out and test these out. My name is Mike and I'm from United Ammo and this is Brandon. Brandon's wearing a level 3A bulletproof vest underneath this shirt and today we're going to be experimenting with an experimental 12 gauge bunker buster slug. We're going to set this round off with this 12 gauge here. It is an experimental round so we're going to try to use as much precaution as possible. We're going to use a Kevlar ballistic panel as a shrapnel blanket and we're going to remote set this firearm off. Yeah, that completely missed. Now the slug missed. We didn't get a chronograph reading, but we still got a lot of good information from this high-speed camera footage. 
and we actually got a really clean launch on this it was just too bad it missed but uh, you can see the condition of the sabos the uh, gas seal the fiber wads and the slug itself the slug is flying straight and true no spin at all not even a wobble there doesn't appear to be any type of safety issue i'm david I'm going to give it a shot first time shooting shotguns is it yep oh my gosh I'm a revolver guy you're gonna be a shotgun guy by the end of the day <laughs> whoa reading did you get a reading error, error. whoa in test number two, the slug again is pretty stable. Just a little bit of a yaw there, but overall pretty good. His uh, aim was decent. He just shot a little bit high, but the windage was dead on. And we saw just a tremendous impact on that Kevlar vest. And that's usually a sign that the slug actually caught the projectile, but if you look closely, we could see the slug had actually passed through that Kevlar vest and is tumbling off into the background. What happened? Did it catch it in the vest? No, actually, it, with great accuracy, it penetrated and went straight through the vest here, wadded up a bunch of Kevlar, went straight through Brandon, all the way through to the other side, and it came out right here. Right there's the hole, all the way through. Man. Twelve seventy-five. 1275. Yeah, I was aiming right about here and this time it dropped quite a bit for me. Um, other than that, it still made it clean through the wood. It went through the vest once again, but did not come out the back. And then you found it, right? Yeah, I found it just a couple feet away, just on the other side of the table here. And this is what it looks like. Here, let me hand it to me and I'll get a close-up of that. You can see it's something a little dinged up on the nose, a little, little mushrooming, but but for the most part, still couldn't reshoot it, but uh, didn't mushroom out much. That, that's, a, that's a penetrator there. And the impressive part was that it still continued to bust through this whole entire piece of wood. Yeah, I didn't even slow it down hardly. Then through one panel of Kevlar. Yep. As you can see, the bunker buster had no problem passing through our wood barrier. It looked like it was made out of styrofoam. In fact, it just hardly moved the wood block at all. What's next, David? Well, we have this uh, pink cow. We thought it was a pig. Thought it was a pig at first, started looking at it. It's a cow. Took the air out of it, filled it full of water, and froze it. <laughs> so, oh, it's coming apart. He's melting in the sun. Yeah, it's hot gotta, out today. We gotta hurry up. He's already gonna kill over. Okay, let's get it. It's right. filming it. Okay, I'm rolling. Put that thing squarely in your shoulder. Okay, you good? Yeah. I'm ready. When I get nothing. Okay, you good? Yeah, I'm ready. Oh, damn it. When I get nothing. Well, I never triggered the high speed camera because I thought he just missed. I was expecting a massive reaction, this thing blowing up. So we'll shoot it one more time. Damn. David took a second shot, hit it again. You can see the two holes uh, kind of around its neck there where he hit it the first time. But once again, not a really energetic reaction. The slug sort of just slipped through that thing without any hydrostatic shock or anything like that. But the good news is David will be able to patch that thing up and we'll use it again someday. It's a great target. You know what time it is? <laughs> it's time to get the lead out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds stupid, but we're going to go with it. Okay, we got the lead plate now. 
We're gonna hit the lead plate with this bunker buster. Bunker buster. Bunker. Oh shit! <laughs> oh shit! Now another reason I don't like steel is because it makes a huge cloud of heated gases which obscures the imagery on the camera. It's almost as bad as trying to film a black powder rifle. He had a pretty good solid impact and you saw the slug kind of float back at us. Not really a, any danger there. I thought of any slug that might penetrate the lead plate that would have been it. But nope. As you can see it did do a uh, pretty good number on it about halfway through the entire distance of this plate. Still created a lot of damage. Yeah, but I thought we'd have a hole there. Did you find the slug? Yeah, we found the slug. It decided to come back and say hello to us. And that's the slug after it hit that lead plate. And it hit nose first and everything. You can see that. You're going to say, now we're going to shoot it through full rifling and see if it makes it better. Now we're going to shoot full rifling. Speak up, come on. <laughs> I'm not good at that part. <laughs> You're good right there. Just say it. Okay, go. Now we're going to shoot it through full rifling. And see if rifling makes everything yeah, better. Everything come on. Everything better. <laughs> wow, I just went right through it. Damn. Didn't blow up. Still not convinced that rifling makes anything better, at least in this case, but we had a more accurate shot. But I attribute that to having better optics and that nice red dot is a lot easier to aim than trying to use a front bead sight only. But we could really see how that torpedo shaped projectile really efficiently traveled through that joint compound, hardly disrupting it at all. And it's quite a contrast from last week's test of the steel tornado. Take your time, no rush. Okay, hit it. All right, so we have a, a kind of a small temporary wound cavity in there. It went right through there. The block hardly slowed it down at all. Um, but yeah, he shot it a little bit low just because he's not used to the red dot on that. Usually you have to aim about an inch ab above where you want to hit at that range because of the uh, bore axis. But uh, I think he did well, David. Went straight through the block, right into our Kevlar vest, and you recovered it, right, David? There it is. It's this, uh, It's a little bit mushed, but um, more in, not a big energy dumper. These things are a, a penetrator, and especially when we shot the that bag of uh, joint compound, it just we expected that to blow up into pieces, but uh, it just went through there without hardly disrupting it at all. Just a different type of projectile, just made for. It'd probably be great for a bear or something you want, yeah. or a dinosaur or rhinoceros, whatever endangered species you're hunting that day. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's pterodactyls. But that's it. Uh, I want to thank you guys for coming out. Thank you for having us. Yep. Had fun shooting a shotgun for the first time. Love the first time. Yep. You got to go out and buy one now. Most likely. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna enjoy it. Yeah. It's going to be a lot cheaper than shooting that 500 mag. Uh, yeah. A lot cheaper. A lot cheaper. <laughs> and probably easier on your hands, too. Oh, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> now, David's placement on the gel block was actually quite good. It was in a nice, clean area. But we had a very small temporary wound cavity, only about 3 inches in size, in fact. But they extended the entire length of the 16-inch gel block. I guess if we learned one thing today, it's that... That hemispheric nose, like the torpedo, is pretty efficient going through different types of fluids. And really, it's not much different than a non-deforming sphere going through the same fluids. And just as a comparison, this is the botfly. It, it, it didn't expand or anything either, but we definitely saw a way different reaction in the gel block than we did with the bunker busters.
And a quick thank you to our Patreon supporters out there. At the early part of this year, things were looking really good, and I actually started telling folks to, hey, cut back or eliminate your Patreon pledge. We're doing good now. Well, I probably spoke too soon, but I like to be honest with everybody, let people know what's going on. In the last month, YouTube has really put the screws to us, and a lot of people are getting unsubscribed, they're not getting their vid the videos in their notifications, and the views are down by, oh, I haven't seen them this low in 10 years. But thank you guys for sticking with me. We'll see you next time.